the Bible is not a book about God in the way I thought it was. Recent revelations challenge long-standing beliefs about the Bible, suggesting extensive misinterpretations from its original Hebrew. This discovery, started by a Vatican Bible translator, unveils a completely new narrative, diverging significantly from traditional depictions of God found in Jesus' teachings and the New Testament. Join us as we explore the groundbreaking findings of scholars Paul Wallace and Mauro Biglino. Let's dive in. Who is Paul Wallace? Paul Wallace is a renowned international author known for his best-selling works. He also hosts Fifth Kind TV, provides life coaching services, and conducts extensive research into world mythologies and ancestral tales. His works strive to demystify the mysteries behind us, the potential within us hidden in us, as well as our relationship with the universe. He has been actively involved in the church and globally recognized for his best-selling books, Escaping from Eden, and The Scars of Eden, which have been positively mentioned by prominent figures in the ancient alien contact studies area. Besides that, he has been highly praised for his oratory skills, which made him famous at the global summits and other international conferences. He has millions of viewers worldwide with his interviews and documentaries. Being a theologian, his studies have concentrated on Christian mysticism and spirituality, and his research into world mythology and ancestral narratives has also enriched the study of the power of mythology and folklore in the creation of historical accounts, cultural identities, and the interaction between archaeology and folklore. Wallace's work on dog ancestor myths, which are prevalent in Chinese sources, has been accepted as historical fact by the late Tang period and has been used to explain the origins of certain ethnic groups. The dog ancestor myth is primarily associated with Han peoples stemming from north of the Yangtze, while bottle gourd myths are more closely linked with non-Han peoples living south of the Yangtze. In addition to his work on mythologies and ancestral tales, Wallace has also contributed to the field of archaeology by exploring the use of folklore in archaeological research. This strategy gives knowledge of the cultural values, beliefs, and practices of old societies, as well as their conception of place and memory. The recognitions of Wallace's service include the Award of Companion of the Order of Australia, the highest civilian award in Australia. His work for the church, education, and theology has produced far-reaching effects, not only in matters of spirituality and Christian mysticism, but also in interfaith relationships. Mauro Biglino Moving on to the second scholar, Mauro Biglino, an Italian translator who spent years working for the Vatican. Biglino dedicated himself to translating, publishing, and presenting his findings at conferences. His journey began with the challenging task of translating Masoretic Hebrew manuscripts for the Catholic publisher Edizioni San Paolo. Biglino's expertise lies in analyzing the original Hebrew texts to explore the nuances of their linguistic meanings. He diverges from numerous subsequent interpretations found in the Bible and church history. Biglino's writings cover a broad range of topics, from conspiracy theories to ufology and theories about ancient astronauts, making them an influential voice in both national and international discussions. He admits freely basing his ideas on the classic writings of Eric von Daniken and Zechariah Sitchin, who are well known for their controversial theories. This intellectual journey of his takes about 30 years of diligent study of religious texts through the classical origin. Mauro Biglino's work covers a wide range of different questions, such as conspiracy theories, ufology, as well as mysteries of ancient astronauts, and has been the reason for his popularity domestically and internationally. His intellectual path comprises about 30 years of scientific research into religious texts based on the classics. The exploration of unconventional theories is one of the main aspects of Biglino's work. He was very inspired by Eric von Daniken and Zechariah Sitchin, pioneers in this field. These two prominent scholars are known for their revolutionary opinions and interpretations of ancient scripts about extraterrestrial interference in human history and the origin of civilization. One of his main contributions in translation into Hebrew is to criticize the existing interpretations of the Bible, which can lead to misunderstandings due to misreading the old text. Biglino presents his evidence and insights through various mediums such as books, videos, and conferences, reaching a global audience. His meticulous analysis of Hebrew scriptures advocates for a literal rather than symbolic understanding of the Bible, 
which becomes clearer as one delves deeper into his work. Biglino's work on the Bible has been recognized with various honors, including the publication of 19 books of the Bible from the ancient Hebrew text of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia by Edizioni San Paolo. He has also been interviewed on Italian national television and various radio networks, and he is a keynote speaker at conferences and seminars throughout Italy. He has also added another perspective to the ongoing debate about the relationship between religion and science, which is the existence of extraterrestrial life. Reverend Jose Gabriel Funes, a prior Vatican astronomer, has explained that there is no conflict in believing in God and the idea of extraterrestrial brothers, and Biglino's study may shed light on this issue. Biglino's Interpretative Approach Biglino's approach to biblical analysis employs a hypothetical framework, often using phrases like, let's pretend that, as a starting point. He posits that the Bible in its current form differs significantly from its original version. His focus is on a literal translation of sacred texts, leading to a provocative claim that the Bible doesn't discuss God as traditionally understood. Instead, according to Biglino, it narrates interactions between the family of Jacob, Israel, and a being named Yahweh, part of a group called the Elohim, tasked with governing Israel under the leadership of Elon. Biglino's interpretation distinguishes his work as unique and unequivocal, sparking considerable attention and debate. His exploration of the word Elohim, as understood in the Christian tradition, adds further depth to his unconventional approach to biblical analysis. Each name attributed to God reflects a different aspect of his divine nature, even though there is only one deity. The authors of the Bible used various names to describe this singular entity, with Elohim being one of the prominently invoked terms in the sacred texts. It appears in the opening verse of Genesis, stating that, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and recurs approximately 2750 times throughout the Old Testament. The term Elohim signifies the Supreme One or Mighty One, extending its application beyond a singular deity to encompass human leaders, judicial figures, and celestial beings who demonstrate sovereign authority or formidable strength. However, Mauro Biglino presents a different interpretation of Elohim's meaning. He suggests that Elohim, rather than being singular, is plural. We will be delving into his perspective on the literal meaning of Elohim in this video, so keep watching. As a distinguished and often controversial figure, Biglino has dedicated decades to meticulously translating ancient biblical Hebrew for Edizioni San Paolo, a leading European publishing house. Specializing in religious literature despite lacking formal academic qualifications, Mauro Biglino's passion and deep interest in ancient texts have earned him recognition as one of Italy's most esteemed Bible translators. His accessible and enthusiastic approach to scholarship has guided many in understanding the Bible's original messages. It's important not to mistake him for a conspiracy theorist. His credentials attest to his knowledge and expertise in this field. Biglino offers a unique perspective on the Bible's meaning. According to Biglino, the Bible is a complex text with inherent uncertainties in its interpretation due to our limited understanding of ancient scriptures. He argues that a deeper exploration of the subject is necessary to fully comprehend the meaning of the text. This perspective challenges traditional interpretations of the Bible, which often rely on established theological frameworks. In contrast, Biglino stresses a holistic and critical approach to interpreting the Bible, appreciating its historical and cultural background as well. Professor Garbini, a Semitic philology expert at La Sapienza University in Rome, offers a unique perspective on the Hebrew language. He suggests that Hebrew is a South Phoenician Canaanite dialect, one among several in the Canaanite language family. This perspective challenges the traditional view of Hebrew as a distinct and separate language. Garbini's research is based on the reconstruction of Hebrew during the first millennium AD, known as Majority Hebrew. During this time, the focus was more on theological implications than linguistic structure, influenced by diverse strands of Judaism. This means that our understanding of Hebrew is based on a reconstruction that was heavily influenced by theological considerations rather than linguistic analysis. 
Biglino argues that when reading the Bible, we're not dealing with a text governed strictly by grammatical rules, but one shaped by ideological influences, where grammatical precision wasn't the primary concern for the original authors. This becomes particularly relevant when considering the evolution of grammatical rules over time, such as the singularization of the inherently plural term Elohim within the biblical context, a topic that remains debated. Biglino insists that Elohim should be understood as a plural term, not translated simply as God. Edizioni San Paolo's publication of 177 Old Testament books, translated directly from the Masoretic text by Mauro Biglino, has played a significant role in presenting his interpretations to the public. Initially uneventful, these translations were incorporated into their Hebrew Interlinear Bible edition. The Hebrew Interlinear Bible Discussing the Hebrew Interlinear Bible, what was it? The Hebrew Interlinear Bible, being an instrumental object of the Old Testament studies in its original language, is an expensive and rare artifact. It was a kind of Bible that gave a literal word-for-word -word translation of the Hebrew text beside the original Hebrew. This allowed the readers to perceive the depth and subtleties of the original language. The Hebrew Interlinear Bible had different versions, including online versions, software applications, and printed editions, the online version offered by Scripture 4. All was most preferred by individuals who liked their Bible studies to be conducted digitally. On a left-to-right paper, it was accompanied by a transliteration of the Hebrew letters for identification. For those who prefer a physical Bible, the Interlinear Bible, the Hebrew-Greek-English edition, was the favorite of many. That edition included the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, the Greek text of the New Testament, and an English translation, each given in the side-by-side -side form of presentation. It also involved the concordance numbers above each word, enabling readers to search the lexicon, which provided the meaning of each word in Hebrew or Greek easily. The Hebrew Interlinear Bible was compiled from the Masoretic Text, the recognized version of the Hebrew Masoretic Old Testament. This Hebrew manuscript was not only well preserved over generations by diligent Jewish scholars, but also was considered to be the most authentic and accurate copy of the Old Testament. Besides, the Hebrew Interlinear Bible offered the chance to see in its true context the original language of the Old Testament. That was significant because the Hebrew language was loaded with idioms, metaphors, and other figures of speech that can be challenging to do with English. Through parallel viewing of the original Hebrew text and the literal translation, the readers could chip into the comprehension of the meaning of the text. One more reason why the Hebrew Interlinear Bible was good for those who were learning Hebrew was that it could be used as a study tool as well. Students could gain a learning advantage through exposure to both the original Hebrew and a literal translation, which would then improve their knowledge of Hebrew grammar, vocabulary, and syntax. The meaning of each word can be ascertained by them with the help of the Strong's concordance numbers, through which they can have an in-depth understanding of the Hebrew lexicon. Biglino's Departure from Traditional Interpretations However, despite the Hebrew Interlinear Bible having all of this great stuff, the situation shifted when Biglino began to publish his interpretations of the ancient texts. Biglino elaborated on his relationship with Edizioni San Paolo through videos. Essentially, Biglino's readings of the Bible diverge significantly from the theological constructs developed over two millennia. He asserts with certainty that the contemporary Bible does not reflect the original text. Provocatively, he claims that the Bible does not discuss God, but rather narrates the history of a single Semitic tribe, the descendants of Jacob, and their interactions with Yahweh, whom they regard as their leader. This raises the question, is Yahweh not considered God? According to Biglino, the concept of God familiar to us today is the result of 2,000 years of theological interpretation heavily influenced by Greek Hellenistic philosophy. This extensive theological analysis has led to the portrayal of God as immortal, transcendent, all-knowing, and all-powerful. Yet Biglino points out that the biblical narratives depict a different character in Yahweh, one who exhibits fatigue, dirtiness, anger, thirst, jealousy, ferocity, and even cruelty. Most notably, Yahweh is not depicted as a solitary figure. Biglino emphasizes that Yahweh is merely one member of a collective known as the Elohim, challenging traditional monotheistic views. The Hebrew word Elohim, traditionally translated as God in biblical translations, is inherently plural, yet used to denote the singular concept of God. 
This discrepancy has been perceived as a sign of the monotheistic reinterpretation of ancient biblical texts over thousands of years. Biglino suggests that due to the ambiguity surrounding the exact meaning of Elohim, it might be a good idea to refrain from translating it, leaving it in its original form. This recommendation gains traction when considering that Elohim is not consistently translated as God throughout the Bible. It also assumes the meanings of kings in the context of Genesis 6 and Judges in Psalm 82. These revelations have led to Mauro Biglino gaining significant attention online, with his extensive lectures captivating thousands. Despite criticism from some academic circles that dismiss Biglino's interpretations as mere science fiction, the questions he raises continue to provoke thought. The translation of Elohim as a singular God, the mixing of Western concepts of God with ancient Semitic narratives, and the extraordinary lifespans of some biblical figures are among the topics that Biglino's work explores deeply. Figures like Adam, Seth, and Enosh reportedly lived up to 900 years, whereas Abraham and Moses lived less than 200 years, raising questions about these discrepancies. Labeling Mauro Biglino as a charlatan might seem justifiable to those deeply entrenched in the belief of a spiritual, omniscient entity as depicted in traditional monotheistic frameworks. However, dismissing his critiques without consideration would ignore potential discrepancies within this carefully constructed framework spanning two millennia. Imagine if scholars paused to reconsider the long-held assumption that Elohim refers solely to God. Compelling grammatical and narrative evidence suggests that it denotes a collective of distinct individuals, each with their roles, traits, and intentions. The biblical text itself introduces various other Elohim alongside Yahweh. Biglino's contributions lie in raising important questions that challenge traditional interpretations, leading some orthodox scholars to adopt a defensive stance against these inquiries that deviate from established theological doctrines. Interestingly, Scholars like Princeton Theological Seminary's Professor Mark Smith are beginning to recognize the prevalence of polytheism in early Israelite history. This challenges the traditional view of the Bible as portraying a strictly monotheistic religion from its outset. Polytheism Polytheism was a belief system that posits the existence of multiple gods, each with their domains, powers, and personalities. This belief system is one of the oldest forms of religion, with evidence of polytheistic practices dating back to the earliest human civilizations. The Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, contained references to polytheism. In the Old Testament, several passages refer to other gods, such as Exodus 20, 3, which states, You shall have no other gods before me. This phrase was one of the Ten Commandments that God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. The existence of other gods is also acknowledged in Psalm 82. 6 reads, I said, You are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. Professor Smith supposes that monotheism arose as an opposite reaction towards strongly rooted polytheism. In his work, The Early History of God, he suggests that late edits might have been responsible for refiguring Israel's polytheistic past into a monotheistic story instead. Theology, in its general nature, is based on belief and not on observation of concrete evidence. This ensures ongoing debates and questions about a text written millennia ago by humans. The Bible, whether divinely inspired or not, reflects its creator's imperfections and cultural influences, including those from ancient civilizations like the Sumerians and Akkadians. This perspective is echoed by best-selling author and speaker Paul Wallace. His exploration of the word Elohim and its plural form, led him to a transformative realization, departing from previous narrow interpretations of Christian orthodoxy. Rather than as a singular narrative about God, the Bible can be seen as a series of stories depicting many different entities, from the earliest passages to the final verses. This includes the debate surrounding the word Elohim, one of the oldest words in the Bible, translated as God. As Mauro Biglino pointed out, Elohim is a masculine plural noun typically associated with plural verbs. Paul Wallace's deep dive into this linguistic aspect revealed that the plurality of Elohim is not merely a grammatical glitch. Instead, it represents an ancient version of the narrative where Elohim was understood to embody a collective of distinct beings. The Hebrew Canon Paul Wallace, as a historian, used the Hebrew Canon, which another name is the Tanakh in his book. The book was an authoritative collection of Jewish religious texts, 
consisting of three main sections. The Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, is generally divided into three significant sections, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. The process was carried out over centuries, which resulted in an official version of the Second Temple, 516 BCE, 70 CE, the Canon. The Torah is the first and the holiest segment of the Hebrew Canon, which by the way was also known as the Pentateuch. It contains five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Torah was the source book in Judaism and Jewish tradition and it was given to Moses from God on the mount where he called Sinai. The next component of the Hebrew Bible is the Nevium, or the Prophets. It brings out the Joshua's, Judges, Samuel's, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve Minor Prophets. The Nevi'im, being one of the most important parts of the Torah, contains the message and the words of the prophets that came from God and who were designated to prophesy the Israel nation. The last two sections of the Hebrew Bible called Ketuvim, on the other hand, contain poems and other wisdom literature. The Jewish scripture consists of different types of literary genres, which include poetry, wisdom literature, historical writing, and apocalyptic literature. The Ketuvim comprises the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, and 1 and 2 Chronicles, among other books. The process of the Hebrew Bible constitution is complex and includes the submission of historical, cultural, and religious elements. The canon was not proclaimed once and for all, but it evolved through the ages, with different works being included or excluded at different times. By the termination of the Second Temple period, the structure of the canon was already set and has remained the same ever since. The canon was considered to be the Word of God, and it was studied and interpreted by rabbis and scholars to this day. Inside the canon also, there was a concept known as the Sky Council, which referred to a gathering of multiple entities referred to as Elohim. Wallace, in his Eden series comprising Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden and Echoes of Eden, suggests that interpreting Elohim as the powerful ones, or leaving it untranslated, provides clarity to the stories and addresses moral problems arising from violent and seemingly unjust actions attributed to the Elohim. The translation of Elohim as a singular god fails to account for the conflicts among the Elohim and the violence portrayed in biblical narratives. Wallace argued that reading these stories with Elohim as the powerful ones helps recognize that these accounts are abridged versions of older tales from ancient Mesopotamian civilizations. However, this interpretation faces resistance from those deeply rooted in traditional faith, particularly when it challenges the Christian theological concept of the Holy Trinity. Critics argue that the plural form of Elohim aligns with the Trinity's view of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, suggesting no misinterpretation or problem. Wallace counters this by noting that the Holy Trinity is a Christian doctrine that emerged much later than the Bible was written, questioning its original intent by the authors. Moreover, the most recent editors of the Hebrew canon favored a monotheistic theology, evident in the substitution of the sacred name Yahweh for earlier references to Elohim in certain texts. This editorial shift raises moral dilemmas and questions about the actions attributed to a holy and loving God, especially those involving the destruction or regression of civilizations. Wallace challenges the idea that such actions occur due to conflicts within the Holy Trinity, emphasizing that this interpretation does not refer to the Trinity in the first place. These debates highlight the complexity of interpreting ancient texts and the ongoing evolution of theological perspectives over time. Elohim, the multifaceted term. Various acts within biblical narratives remain questionable and contradictory, leading to debates over whether the term Elohim represents the Holy Trinity, which seems unlikely given the context and implications of the narratives. The original tales likely depict different events, with Elohim signifying the powerful ones, a term that some theologians argue could refer to beings more advanced than humans without specifying their exact nature. This interpretation suggests caution in jumping to definitive conclusions based solely on the term Elohim. TNT Clark's publication, The Theology of the Old Testament, edited by SDF Salman, includes a quote from theologian A.B. Davidson suggesting that angels are part of the class of Elohim. According to Wallace, this illustrates the varied translations of Elohim within the Hebrew canon. 
where it can mean God, chieftains, judges, landlords, or angels, depending on the context. If Elohim is such a flexible word, why would it be chosen to refer to the singular God? The term Elohim indeed showcases fascinating linguistic elasticity within the biblical texts, serving as a designation for the singular transcendent God while simultaneously referring to a variety of other entities. This multiplicity of meanings prompts scholars to wonder why such a versatile word was chosen to represent the divine. A.B. Davidson notes that Elohim, meaning powers, is applied from the human perspective to all entities perceived as superior to mankind, encompassing the divine and the celestial. However, scripture maintains a clear distinction between God and other beings, such as angels, never conflating the two. Wallace argues that this explanation doesn't fully address the diverse applications of Elohim across different contexts, where it can imply angels, false gods, demons, judges, or God. Because of this ambiguity, Wallace suggests reading the Bible with the term Elohim left in to make the narratives clearer to modern readers. Michael Heiser Discovery A theologian and scholar of the Hebrew Bible, Michael Heiser, has suggested an interpretation of the word Elohim, which is simply a broad spectrum of powerful entities from one extreme to the other. As stated by Heiser, the word Elohim isn't just limited to the God of the Israelites, but also other divine beings, like angels, demons, and all other heavenly creatures. This was given the meaning in the Hebrew Bible, where there are lots of references to deities referred to as Elohim. On the other hand, Heiser's interpretation may partially address why Elohim was used at first to refer to God. However, it does not fully explain the connection with possible archons. In the Hebrew scriptures, Elohim is used to depict the one true GD, but it is used to describe other divine beings like the gods of nations as well. With this, questions are raised concerning the type of war or connection between Yahweh and other Elohim. In terms of where this is most evident is that of the kingdom of Yahweh. In the Hebrew Bible, he is frequently presented as a king, leading a divine council of other Elohim or assembly. This council is composed of both faithfully serving and rebellious angels as God's messengers, warriors, and counselors. The Bible portrays Yahweh's kingship as not absolute. In some instances, other Elohim challenge his authority, seeking dominance or undermining his power. This theme emerges in narratives like the angelic rebellion in Genesis 6 and Yahweh's confrontation with Leviathan in Job 41 polytheistic traces in biblical narratives and the ethical concerns. By analyzing these stories within their historical and ideological context, scholars acknowledge the presence of multiple deities rather than interpreting them solely as monotheistic tales. The presence of rival gods helps explain certain themes, such as Yahweh's response to a king consulting another deity Ekron instead of him. The rivalry among the Elohim is further evidenced by the Ten Commandments' emphasis on exclusive worship of Yahweh. This command urges followers to renounce other gods and pledge allegiance solely to Him. This paints a picture within Hebrew narratives that resembles a pantheon, where Yahweh is a powerful entity among many. The notion of a celestial assembly, the Sky Council led by Yahweh, is challenging to comprehend suggesting an evolution from an earlier tradition that acknowledged multiple Elohim overseeing their human communities. Mauro Biglino and Paul Wallace highlight ethical problems arising when interpreting Elohim's stories as narratives about a singular God, echoing sentiments from early Christianity where influential church fathers questioned traditional interpretations of Hebrew scriptures. During the Council of Jerusalem, recorded in Acts 15, there was acknowledgement that these texts shouldn't be the sole basis for Christian doctrine. Early theologians argued against interpreting Elohim narratives as stories about a singular God, highlighting moral problems and justifications for actions attributed to God that would be deemed unjust if attributed to humans. Wallace and Biglino agree that the final compilation of the Hebrew canon was driven by ideology rather than linguistic precision, resulting in sanitized texts with polytheistic elements obscured in later translations. Wallace suggests that the original versions of these stories acknowledged multiple deities or superior beings, a concept lost in later interpretations. Understanding these stories requires delving into their historical and ideological context to grasp the complexities of divine representation. 
and the evolution of religious narratives over time. These revelations shed light on the subtle understanding of ancient texts and the complexities of translating them into modern interpretations. The concept of multiple powerful beings vying for influence, as suggested by the plural verbs in Hebrew texts, challenges traditional monotheistic narratives and offers a henotheistic perspective where one god is revered above others. Translators like Mauro Biglino play a crucial role in providing precise translations without theological bias, revealing subtle nuances that may be lost in standard English translations. Paul Wallace's exploration of Elohim as the powerful one aligns biblical stories with their ancient sources, presenting a coherent picture of a world populated by diverse entities rather than a single omnipotent deity. The debates among the Elohim regarding human intelligence and the conflicts within their ranks, as depicted in Genesis, resonate with ancient Mesopotamian narratives, highlighting the continuity of themes across different cultures. Whether one adopts the interpretation of Elohim as the powerful one, or simply retains the term Elohim in the text for a broader understanding, these revelations offer new insights into human origins, cosmic roles, and the rich tapestry of ancient mythologies. Thank you for watching another episode. What are your thoughts on these revelations? Do they resonate with your understanding of biblical narratives and ancient myths? Let us know in the comments below. See you next time.